to come. Yes, we can. Person, woman, man, camera, TV. What the fuck is wrong with you? In and out. There I am. Hi. Welcome to What the Franklin. I'm Chip Franklin. Uh, man, we got a big show today. A lot to talk about. Could the U.S. power grid be shut down? It's a lot easier than you might imagine. And it's pretty frightening. That scenario is still to come. Um, the 10 best Christmas movies of all time and the worst Christmas movie of all time that everybody loves also to come. Um, and we'll get into a little bit about uh, the Republican Party is lost and uh the question really is, do we want to find them again? Uh, but right now, and also, you got to hang with us here in the first half hour. I'm going to give you the real facts behind the Brittany Griner case and not the Republican talking points, which are embarrassing. To say. They're so embarrassing, they've actually started to back away from them when you find out the truth about this guy. So there's a lot to talk about. The question, though, here is, is Trump is Trump is beginning to melt down um, even more than before. And and. Well, let's see if you can help me interpret exactly what he means by this. Today on a radio show, Mr. Trump warned that there would be, quote, big problems if he's indicted in the classified documents case. If it happened, I think you'd have problems in this country, the likes of which perhaps we've never seen before. I don't think the people of the United States would stand for it. What kind of problems, Mr. President? I think they'd have big problems. Big problems. You know that the legacy media will say you're attempting to incite violence with that statement. How do you respond to what will inevitably... That's not, a, that's not inciting. I'm just saying what my opinion is. I don't think the people of this country would stand for it. Former President Trump also insisted that an indictment would not stop him from running for the White House again. All right. Joining me right now is, is a man who probably knows more about Trump than any journalist here. He is uh, the um, the founder of DCReport.org and has written about uh, Donald, as he likes to call him, because he knows it pisses him off. Uh, David K. Johnston joins us here. Uh, David, uh, that is inciting right there. And it's it's the way that Trump does it. It's the mafia thing. I'm not telling the people to do it. I'm just saying it could happen. Right. But he's just talking in code. Of course, he means inciting violence in the same way that he incited the insurrection. Right. And uh, by the way, we had a, a search warrant lawfully executed at his house, and the American people don't seem very troubled by it. No, I had Devlin Barrett on yesterday from the Washington Post, and we're talking yeah. just about, you know, there's two sides to looking at the, the Mar-a-Lago thing, for, because I, in my opinion, it's, it's important, but it's not anywhere close to the importance of January 6th. Um, you know, I, to me, it's like I think he just took that stuff because he, he said, I can't. It belongs to me. I'm the president. He just took it. And I don't think he brought it down there to sell or anything. I just think he's an idiot. And he just took it down there. And um, I mean, he, he is he's either incredibly brilliant or incredibly stupid. And I sometimes I think that, you know, some people say, oh, don't underestimate him. And, but then I look at this and he like he was bringing him in a U-Haul. And then now they found the, the latest documents in a in a storage unit. Um, I mean, where is he drifting these days? Is he, I mean, I've heard rumors that he's just screaming at people, invectives and, and pejoratives every day. Well, uh, first of all, Chip, I have a more negative view of his taking these documents than you do. Um, they were left around um, unprotected at Mar-a-Lago where we know all sorts of foreign governments have sent intelligence agents in an effort to work their way into the Trump uh, household. And Donald doesn't know how to uh, appreciate an assessment of another country's military or its nuclear weapons or a lot of other things. But one thing Donald knows is the monetary value of things. And the documents he took have enormous monetary value to countries who want to know about one of uh, their rival or hostile. Wow. Countries. So you think he really brought these along with the idea that I could sell them if I really need money? Uh, well, or I can broker... Deals. I don't think it would be as crude as handing him money, but look what happened with his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Uh, he requested enormous amounts of uh, intelligence material after his father-in-law gave him a clearance over the objection of all the security officials. Yeah. According to Malcolm Nance, more documents on the Middle East than the whole rest of the National Security White House staff combined. He 
makes buddies with the de facto dictator, uh, MBS, and then despite the negative recommendations, because the New York Times got a hold of them, of all the financial and political advisors to the royal family in Saudi Arabia, they gave Jared $2 billion to manage and at excessively high uh, management fees. Uh, that's more the kind of deal you would see. But um, Donald certainly didn't take him so he could sit there and peruse them at night because he doesn't understand any of the things that this is about. He's He's a very uneducated man who has pulled off this fraud of making people think he's deeply informed. <laughs> but where is he today right now? And mentally, do you think? I mean, does he really oh. believe um, looking at the numbers and the numbers are not good that are coming in, whether they're poll numbers or, um, you know, the possibility of indictments? Um, and, and I'm does he really believe he can get the Republican nomination? Oh, I, Donald will convince himself of that against all fate. Um, I, I would suggest that there are three scenarios likely to play out here going forward. Uh, Donald, by rallying his base, you know, even though it's a minority, might get the Republican nomination. I think it's unlikely, but it's possible. Uh, if he does... Well, can I interrupt order, you real quick? Yeah. Who's going to run against him? It doesn't matter if I think he can. he possibly can get it. But my point is, if he were to get those three things, if he were to get the Republican nomination, the Democrats are guaranteed to win. I mean, he lost the popular vote twice. He's going to lose by even more this time around. Secondly, if he doesn't get the Republican nomination, the Republicans have to worry that he'll run as an independent. Well, guess what? The Democrats could run, you know, anybody for president and they'll win. The third scenario is Donald doesn't get the Republican nomination. And he then says to his followers, boycott elections, don't vote. Well, guess who benefits from that? The Democrats. Right. I mean, he is Donald is like a wrapped Christmas present that keeps giving to the Democrats at this point. And well, I, I just keep thinking of those six states. Right. I mean, because that's what it breaks down to, yeah. you know, I mean, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio. And then the rest are kind of, you know, up there every from, you know, Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, um, Virginia. Um, I mean, Virginia, Virginia is actually. It, it reminds me a little bit of what I thought Florida could be at one point. You know, it used to be kind of a a red state, except for the D.C. metro area. Right. Um, Florida is lost. And Flo that makes me believe, though, that this um, the, the Trump uh, ether is still strong in some pockets of this country. Oh, it is. It absolutely is. And it will be after he's dead. There are people who believe Donald is a demigod, not demagogue, demigod. Yeah. Donald, you know, has made statements suggesting he's really God or God-like. And there are people who are never going to abandon him no matter what happens, Chip. But there yeah. are a shrinking number of people. They're shrinking only slowly, but they're shrinking. Well, you know, it's interesting because um, I think about this. Uh, the military, uh, you know, uh, I, I was talking about John McCain the other day, and some guy sent me some BS about how McCain was a traitor and all this crap. Um, and, of course, John McCain, to me, is, is a perfect symbol of the old Republican Party, you know, duty and honor first. Right. Um, just so people remember that John McCain, when he was in that Hanoi in a box for, uh, you know, five plus years, uh, he had the opportunity to go home early at one point and decided to stay a year and a half longer because, I mean, a year and a half in a small box with his well, shoulder. He didn't even know how much longer he was going to stay. He didn't know. Right. right exactly. He, he, you know, whatever you think of John McCain's politics. Uh, the man acted honorably on a lot of occasions. Did he act like a politician and sometimes do craven of things? Sure he did. Yeah. Name me a politician who doesn't do that. But standing up for Obama in the middle of that, the last, I, I don't think we've, we're going to see that again in the Republican Party for a long time. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I, I have the sound, but I'm not going to play it for you now. He essentially, a woman said he's a Muslim and he goes, no, he's a good man. He's an American. He's a family man. We just disagree on politics. When is the next time we're going to hear that? Although I didn't hear Herschel Walker's speech. I heard it was actually pretty good, his concession speech. Did you get a chance to see it? No, I, I did not listen to it. Uh, I had enough incoherency from a <laughs> Russian, roulette, Russian roulette playing, lying, denying, yeah, yeah, go on yeah. and on about that. But it, fundamentally, the Republican Party of your and my parents is no longer the Republican Party. And it's now blatantly promoting the following things. Ending democracy, because they're a minority party and they're going to become more and more of a minority party over time. 
enhancing the power of corporations while reducing the power of individuals and promoting bigotry against LBGTQ, immigrants, people of color. And th these are the worst instincts in the Republican Party. The Republicans actually had ideas that they promoted in the 70s, the yeah. 80s, the 90s, and they got a lot of them put in place. Many of them, I think, turned out to be bad ideas, but they had ideas. They don't have any ideas now whatsoever. Yeah. You know what kills me, David? And I, I've said this to you before. It, the Republican Party, all they used to have to do is pull out an appropriations bill and just point out all the, you know, William Proxmire kind of golden fleece stuff, right? And that's all they had to do in the win. They would say, all the Democrats care about is spending on crazy stuff. They're going to do the same thing. They're going to attack the Democrats' positions on LGBTQ, and they're going to come out and say, you know, that they want. I mean, I've already started to hear it, that I have this. Let me play this for you real quick here. Just watch this, because this to me is, this woman here shows me what the Republican Party at their heart still is. Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you my priority. Protect religious liberty protect people of faith, and protect Americans who believe in the true meaning of marriage. I hope and pray that my colleagues will find the courage to join me in opposing this misguided and this dangerous bill. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. The yeah, time you know, has the, expired. The, the huge mistake the Republicans made on marriage equality was when um, Maggie Gallagher from this phony Catholic uh, Protect Marriage group was asked a key question maybe 10 years ago. And that was, well, how does having the two gay guys who live down the street from me being married hurt my marriage? And she had no answer to that. Oh, and I'll tell you what they'll say. They'll say it's our children. It's always the children. You know, the same children that they don't give a shit about that live right. across the country. That as soon, in, in as soon as they're born, they don't care about them. But yeah. it, it, this is an issue on which the world has moved on. And it's a good example of how what the Republicans can't seem to do is adjust to a new world. You know, I wish I could go back to Orange, California, where I lived until I was eight, my grandmother's orange ranch, and all the orange groves were there and the eucalyptus trees giving shade. I wish I could go back to Santa Cruz, where I grew up the rest of my years and lived as an adult for a while where the downtown was before the earthquake in 1989. But you yeah. know what? That doesn't exist anymore. And life moves forward. And, and these are people who are functionally doing the equivalent of saying, we can't have those automobiles. What will it do to the buggy whip industry and the people who will be put out of work who make buggy whips? That's well, you know, David, that's where the term Luddite comes from. Luddites yes. were people that were actually threatened by uh, uh, technology that would destroy their living, you know? Right. Right. And uh, so they weren't like, what they weren't just against technology. They were against that specific technology that was going to put them out of business, which is natural. I mean, you know, uh, I think manufacturer workers across this country should be worried about robots, not immigrants. It's but not somehow more, more, more jobs exist today than have ever existed. We keep finding new ways to do things. And we make progress. And the Republicans are not embracing that anymore. They used to be. They used to talk about investing in the future. They used to be in favor of the public furniture, roads, highways, bridges, uh, which allow the creation of private wealth. They're against all of that now. And all they have to sell is hate, taking away voting rights, uh, and lower taxes for the rich achieved by borrowing money uh, instead of growing the economy. But I will say this, David, that we need the Republican Party uh, 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 that to keep the, the spending and the Democrats in check. Also, yeah. with new ideas about government growth. I mean, the Republican Party in the past um, actually had really strong and, and solid uh, positions that were uh, moral and that looked out for all Americans. And I think that there was a real strong belief and, you know, in, in Adam Smith's invisible hand that they really believed that it could. And when the country became too big for and as, as John Keynes, uh, Keynes used to say, you know, um, in the long run, it'll all work out. And he goes, yeah, but in the long run, we're all dead. We got to get it done now. You and know, Chip, way back in 2015, when Donald announced he was running, I started saying that if the, the Republicans embrace Donald, who is both crazy uh, and utterly a criminal in his behavior, he's a con artist that if they embraced him, it would be the end of the Republican Party uh, and they would go the way of the Whigs, last seen in 1856. Uh, they may, with the name, still c continue, but the Republicans either have to change to adapt to the times 
or they will shrivel. And it's not good if we have the Democrats free across the country, do whatever they want to do, just as it wouldn't be good if we had the same thing with the Republicans. Right. We need competitive uh, econo uh, economics and we need competitive politics. But again, we have to remind the Democrats of this, that this yep. is their responsibility, that if you do gain this power, as Spider-Man said, it comes with a lot of responsibility. David, great to see you again, my friend. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye, Jim. Uh, check out David K. Johnson at dcreport.org. Uh, great stuff there. Um, when I talk about Republicans, uh, what I've always, I, I, you know, Joe Walsh is, I, I find, um, a really interesting guy that I still don't agree with on a lot of political positions, uh, as I would probably say the same for Liz Cheney. Um, but I do admire spit. And our, our next our next guest has uh, just tons of that. She's a, a, I, I don't know if she calls herself a former Republican or Republican. And it's the first time I've ever spoken to her. Um, and it's great to see you. Now, it's, it's help me with it's Cherry, right? It's Sherry. 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 Jacobus, That's what I yes. thought. I'd heard, yeah. I, I went online, I am a, you know, <laughs> and I listened to it. There's like five different ways people have said your names and screwed yeah, up. Yeah. No, uh, you know, I, I before Trump, I was on TV several thousand times over the yeah. course of about 15, 17 years, and then he took care of that. I'm a former Republican. I left the GOP literally the day after they nominated Trump. Uh, I thought that's it. I didn't think they'd really do it, but once they, and I'm a former RNC spokesperson. I worked on Capitol Hill for Republic. I worked in the leadership. I used to work with Ginny Thomas. I mean, I know all of these people really well. So um, it was a big step. You know, it's funny. I, I don't know at what point where um, I remember 1980 when the uh, Republicans uh, beat Jimmy Carter and the young Republicans came in and Reagan came in with this idea of reduced rifts, they call them, you know, which was essentially firing people in Washington, where I grew up in D.C., that thought these they had jobs for life. So on one side, mm -hmm. he, he like kind of woke everybody up and said, you know what, the federal government can't pay you forever. You, we have to be better, you know. Um, it was a long way from Bush wanting to privatize Social Security and stuff like that. But there were there were instant when he, when Reagan said, if government comes to your door, you should run. You know, I think to me, that was a, a message that it still reverberates today. This idea that government is bad. Government can be wasteful and government can mm -hmm. be um, uh, intrusive and and and, uh, and uh, an obstacle in some cases. But. You know, as, as I tell people, read uh, Michael Lewis's The Fifth Risk, a, a book about how important our federal government is and what they do for so many red states, especially. Right. Um, the, the federal government can be um, a tremendous force for good, and it takes both parties to keep it in line. That's not happening now. No. And, and back when I was working on Capitol Hill, you know, I worked for Bob Michael. I'm from Peoria originally, and he was he was the Republican leader and Republicans were in the minority in the House. He was. Uh, a moderate. And, it, you know, at some point when you have one party with too much control, a lot of stuff happens and maybe shouldn't. And the Democrats had held the House for, what, 40 years at that point. So it, it, it wasn't a bad thing that there was a switch. But what we're going through today is very, very different from when Republicans took over the House in the mid 90s. Well, and 94 Reagan actually was good. It, it got Clinton back to the center to a certain extent and you know, woke up. Well, look, what they, what they balanced the budget. There, we had a surplus for the first time, I don't know how long. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was not a bad thing. And so it showed that you can um, have a responsible government. You can be a fiscal conservative. But then, the, but, but at that point, we didn't have this hard core social conservative. It was starting to you know, nip us around the edges. And I remember, um, you know, I'd be at the table. I was uh, communications director for the House Education and Workforce Committee. So I was a leadership position. You know, Ed Gillespie at that time was with Dick Army. Uh, Ari Fleischer we had my same job at House Ways and Means Committee. And, um, you know, we hadn't, these jobs hadn't existed for Republicans in, in a generation. But also at the table was Ginny Thomas, who had sort of this weird amorphous position within House Majority Leader Dick Army. And that's when you start- Just for the started, record, so people know, Ginny Thomas is now married to Supreme court justice clarence well and, and she was then too and he was a supreme yeah. court justice then too so i know that, that, was, that was odd to know that her actions then don't ref, don't uh give an indication like they do today of who well she really I, is. I was actually i don't know about that because really? i i didn't there, there seemed to be this um I mean, I can see there being, you know, right wing coalitions, but there was this now there was a seat at the table for what you had been fringe up until then, a real seat at the table, because I guess they'd been, you know, the religious right had been part of the coalition that brought Republicans into power in the mid 90s, you know, a contract with America and that sort of thing. But it was almost done off in these corners targeted um, very specifically, um, not 
really out in the open. So it felt to me, because I had worked on Capitol Hill before that, I, I came to Washington when um, Ronald Reagan was was president. So and worked, as I said, worked for Bob Michael, worked for other moderates. So this was my my first experience with that. I knew we had these people on, our, on the fringes, um, you know, and, and in Congress, but they seem to have um, more seats at the table and a bigger voice and, and, and real influence that had not existed before. And Jenny you know, was a part of that. What I love about you is that you, you're not afraid to speak your mind. It's got well, you in trouble. I mean, what you- else can they do to me? They took away my livelihood. Yeah. They got me kicked off TV uh, for telling the truth. And, you did. Um, and well, they- you know, when I, I was working for Cumulus and, um, and I called Devin Nunes in a tweet, I called him a fuck knuckle. And, uh, <laughs> And it reverberated all the way back. May to I use that? <laughs> I've never they called me up and said, you know, you can't say that. And it's funny, too, because, I mean, I was it was in a joke. Uh, you know, I mean, if I really wanted to go deep on 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 matters, you know, I mean, like this story, you know, with uh, Brittany Griner and, and Paul Whalen. Um, when you when you look at this, um, I mean, you know, the, the Marsha Blackburn's out saying we left behind a Marine. I'm like, you know, you don't know what the deal was, you know, and, and this and. I just say it bothers me when people in responsible positions open their hillbilly pig hole and start saying this kind of stuff that really is not accurate of what what's going on behind the scenes. And, you know, I want Whalen home, even though he was kicked out of the Marines for writing bad checks and stealing Social Security numbers. People well, why didn't Trump talking. do it? Why didn't Trump take care? Exactly. Of right. He had, he had an opportunity as well. Right. And he's supposedly, you know, close with Putin. Right. I mean, so um, but I guess, you know, the, the thing that that I wonder is where the Republican Party is and, you know, people such as yourself that have left the party um, and, and trying to figure out, you know, is there is there a place for you to stand that is not sinking, you know, with with positions of fiscal responsibility and and a conversation with. I mean, I think there's some people in, in the Democratic Party that are open to, you know, listening to old mm-hmm. school Republicans. I mean, you saw the, the 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 poll numbers in the Democratic Party for Liz Cheney. I mean, you know, she she said horrible things about uh, pro-choicers, you know, but she stood up. I mean, she stood under the umbrella of who we are and said, I'm not going to go Americans, out there. With these other guys. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, look, I stand, I'm an independent. Uh, I vote blue. I think that, um, independents and former Republicans and people who care about corruption and there's so much corruption now that's being overlooked that Trump's getting away with, even if he gets nailed on some thing. Um, You have justice voters, you have anti-corruption voters. And if the Democrats are smart, they'll pull us in as part of a coalition. Um, You know, coalitions do work. We saw that as we just discussed in the mid nineties for Republicans. And for many of us, that is the first and foremost, what we care about. You know, I I worked in in politics for decades. I, I taught political communication strategy in a graduate master's program at George Washington University. I've run campaigns, was doing so at a time when you know, women weren't doing so, but I didn't get the memo. So I, I've been steeped in this for, for, for decades, my entire adult life. And obviously a nod to the far left. They're part of the coalition. They're a bigger part of the coalition. But if you want to be a governing party, if you want the majority, if you want to keep this going for a generation, much in the way that Ronald Reagan took those so-called Reagan Democrats and held them for the party for a generation, you have to pay attention to what people like me, um, a moderate, a former Republican, a justice voter, um, wants and it's anti-corruption. And, um, you know, Liz Warren knew about this. She ran a great anti-corruption campaign and you can put a lot of items under that umbrella of corruption. You can talk about fiscal responsibility. So you want to get fiscal conservatives who are maybe were Republicans because, you know, they, they care about that. They don't, and they kind of tolerate the, the religious right and, and that sort of thing. Don't like it, but they care about fiscal responsibility. Democrats can, can do a lot with, um, the extra money, not all of it, but if they they cut out the the waste and fraud in federal spending, um, they can fund more programs. They might even pull in more Republicans on this stuff. So you put that under the anti-corruption umbrella and you're going to win over a lot of people. Uh, Make sure that all of the people who are in on this with Trump, with trying to overthrow the government and overthrow an election are are punished to the full extent of the law and and anything his family did. This covering up for him. Sure. Well, you know. I mean, look, look back at, uh, yeah. at, at uh, 2008 and the, the, the Great Recession and, and look at AIG and Merrill Lynch and go down the list. No one was prosecuted and they were selling mortgage bonds they knew were bad and they were buying insurance against the bonds that they held and couldn't sell. I mean, 
you know, and then they blamed it on immigrants and poor people again. This is this is the the, the I guess the protocol now uh, moving forward. There's two words that prevent everything from you just said from happening, and that's they're Citizens United. Until yeah. we can take dark Dave money, Posse. yeah. Until we can take, and for people that don't understand how super PACs work, some are good. I've actually worked with some Democratic super PACs. And we have to keep it in line. But the, the idea is, is that people can donate unlimited amounts of dark money to a super PAC and the super PAC can go in. They can't work with a candidate, but they can attack another candidate in, uh, and go for, forever. And we saw we all just saw this from, the you know, back in the 2022 um, midterms. We saw I mean, the weeks leading up to that, all these ads. Well, that's the work of super PACs. And, you know, of course, there, the the First Amendment is so it specifically protects these groups unless they say something that's, you know, patently untrue and could, um, you know, could cause uh, some sort of, you know, damage to the person that they're saying about. But even then, public figures, if you remember the Larry Flint versus the United States when he, he that case, people forget about it, but it, it was about parody and satire. He had a cartoon of Jerry Falwell having sex with his mother in an outhouse. And the Supreme Court said, OK, Supreme Court might revisit that soon. And you mentioned Ari Fleischer earlier. I always think about what he said after 9-11. We have to watch what we say right now. I mean, this is this is a time for grownups. I'm going to have a story in a few minutes about the, uh, how easily and how susceptible our power grid is to attack after what happened in North Carolina recently. They knocked out power to close to 100,000 people, a couple, you know, goobers with shotguns, you know, um, and they weren't even part of an orchestrated attempt to, you know, to hurt our infrastructure. I, I kind of go off on a tangent there, but I do believe it's money. It's it's at the end of the day, it's 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 both Soros and the Koch brothers. We got to take them out of the equation and somehow publicly finance elections. And I know the Supreme Court has said that giving money is free speech, but I don't think anybody out there listening to this right now would agree with their conclusions. No, and it's part of having um, it's part part of what we have in the U.S. is basically oligarchs. I mean, we know it. You know, by the way, Dave Bossie is Mr. Citizens United, and he was Donald Trump's 2016 deputy campaign manager. Joined at the hip, he was brought in by the Cambridge Analytica. He, he was he's tight with the Mercers. Uh, in fact, um, you know, Kellyanne and George Conway went where the Mercers went. They started out with with uh, Ted Cruz, and then when the Mercer money and the Mercers moved to, tr to Trump, that's where they moved. Uh, and then Dave Bossie installed right there in the campaign. He was the guy. Uh, so, you know, the, the money, it, it, right, there's a very small number of, you know, big, big donors who control everything um, uh, because they can give such huge amounts of money and they have huge impact. So when the real power brokers find out that, OK, this is where the Mercers are going, well, some of them are owned, were owned by the Mercers and that's why they moved because they're tied to the money. Um, but that's a signal to the other big donors that this is where we go. So you can literally have um, you can literally have, you know, three or four individuals basically uh, determining who the nominee will be or who the president will be just on. You know, they'd all decide to back the same person and whoever they have under their wing um, has the influence. And it's it's you know, our democracy is very sick in that regard, very broken. And it has been for a while. And you're right. It is because of Citizens United. Um, you've got um, Leonard Leo, uh, Mr. Federalist Society on the far right uh, with enormous power and influence. Uh, I love, and, by the um, way, that they choose that word because federalism is exactly the opposite of what they espouse. You know, I mean, it's yeah. they're, they're free market people. And uh, the, the early Federalists uh, were essentially, you know, the, the, the Republican, I mean, the Democratic Party. Right. And the anti-federalists were the early version of, you know, the Republican Party. And. You're right, though, that I think that, you know, trying to uh, ascertain exactly, you know, or actually I'm trying to educate Americans. Well, the Federalist Society basically is what they control our Supreme Court, basically, and our federal uh, judiciary. Them and the, and the Pope, since there's six Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> but, you know, some of these folks are Opus Dei. That's not really sanctioned by the Pope. So I wouldn't put this on the Pope. This is a whole separate, this uh, is a whole separate animal. Uh, and, um you know, that's where Leonard Leo and a couple of the others come into play and a couple others who are on the Supreme Court or have been on the Supreme Court. Uh, that has nothing to do with the Pope because it's 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 okay. a little scary. But yeah, let me ask you a little prediction here. And I do. I share you. Thank you so much for being here. You, you're, you're looking great. Good to have you here mm -hmm. um, and follow her on Twitter, everybody. It's great stuff. And, and again, she's got some cojones uh, some <laughs> the size of I church love, bells. <laughs> I love it. I love it. No, I really do. I mean, you know, it's it's. Some people have to say it sometimes, and you do. Um, will Trump be indicted before the 2024 election? 
I'm going to say no. Uh, I'd like to say yes. I'd like to think that, you know, the special counsel, you know, he seems like the right guy at the wrong time. It seems like we needed him a year and a half ago. Uh, all we've seen is the can being kicked down the road. And, um, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. But there's been there's no good reason why Trump hasn't been indicted so far in something. And, um, you know, I'm not hopeful. I'm just looking yeah. at what's how things have gone and that's how they're going to be. OK, switching this whole thing around. Best Christmas movie ever. Uh, <laughs> I like love actually. I know it's sexist. Oh, wow. It's, I, I know. I just, one. I just think it's so funny. <laughs> oh. I love seeing Hugh Grant as the prime minister doing the dance and the whole thing. It is, it's, it's terrible because it's sexist and, and, you know, it's all but, but I, I love it. It's, hey, if you get a chance, hang on. Cause at nine 45, I have somebody, I want you to hear his name is David Tice and he's created a documentary about the vulnerability of our power grid. It's frightening. So it's in about 15 yeah. minutes. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Come again soon. All right. Bye-bye. I will. Thank again, you. Sherry Jacobus. Follow her on Twitter. That's her name at Sherry, C-H-E-R-I, Jacobus. Um, I asked her her favorite um, Christmas movie. And so we put together a top 10 list. And who better to join me than uh, a film uh, critique extraordinary. You can see his stuff. My my favorite is, is it goldderby.com is where yeah. it is? Yeah. Yes. yes. And also yeah, that is really and... hard to understand. Yeah, goldderby.com. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, come on. Um, Bill McCuddy and I go back well, back to the 80s, right? I was thinking of you the other day when I was I was talking about I had Bobby Slayton on and we were ah. talking about, you know, you vicious. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you know, and the, all the comics that we've known over the years. And uh, do you still go in the city and, and do comedy in New York? I do, although uh, I have some bad news, which is that Caroline's, Caroline's. yeah, after Caroline Hirsch is a really good friend of mine. I was with her at a a, a club event the other night, actually a, a book party, and uh, you know, she's gonna make movies, she's gonna go on and do documentaries, and she's done a few, she's gonna keep doing that. And the Caroline's brand is gonna live uh, in a video series, but the facility itself in Times Square is closing after 40 years. Uh, real quick, Caroline story. I was there, God, sometime in the mid 80s, and um, it might even been like 84, 83, 84, somewhere in there. And um, it, they were, there was like six comics on the show, and the MC was Chris Rock. And so I'm on stage and uh, I, I, I was supposed to do seven minutes, but I'm like three minutes into it. And I see him in the corner going, get up, get up, get up. Yeah. Eddie Murphy had walked in the car. Uh, I was going to say, it was it Robin Williams? Or, no, yeah. it was Eddie Murphy. And uh, which pissed me off because he just came up on stage and talked. He had no jokes, you know, and it's funny to hear. Better you know, to go before him than to follow him, though. Yeah, maybe, I guess. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, all right. Um, so. In my mind, when we talk about Christmas movies, okay, and I put together my top 10 list. I don't know if you have a top 10. Maybe you can comment on mine. But Oh, I will. Okay. And there's also one movie that should not be on this list, and 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 for a bunch of reasons. But I will – let me just jump right in here with my list. I Did I – oh, my God. Did I lose my list? Where's my list? Oh, we'd hate to see that. You got another two or three Caroline stories for it? <laughs> um what did I, here it is. I just found it. Okay, sorry about that. We got to talk about whether Die Hard is or isn't. By oh, the right. well, that, that Die Hard's on my year, list. Oh, there you go. I think I answered. Every year, there's clickbait on that. Okay. Just, okay, go ahead. So here, first of all, here's a movie that should not, that I think, first of all, I think most of the Christmas movies should be geared to kids. You know, It's a Wonderful Life. Is even Families, more. everybody. Right, exactly. Um, that said, I also like the idea that um, we can look at Christmas uh, in a, in a, without talking about Jesus and all that, and just for the, the, the seasonal part of it. Right. Um, and I, cause I mean, like, you know, I have, I have Jewish friends that dig the holiday and, you know, and the of course. Part, right. Obviously. Cause Hanukkah's are right running around. Anyway. So here's my top 10 list. Let me start at number 10 and you guys are welcome to, sh uh, to jump in on this and we'll get your comments up in just a minute. All right. Uh, so again, I don't Drum think roll. Rudolph, I think Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is a horrible film. He doesn't get accepted until he changes his looks. It's a horrible message for kids. So throw it's that It's the out. Kardashians. <laughs> okay. So number 10, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Great. Great, Great movie. Okay. Incredible. Number that, nine. That, the, the cartoon with Edward Everett Horton. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, number nine, um, which is one that it's interesting. I, I just saw, what is today? I guess Monday or Tuesday night on one of the cable channels, Miracle on 34th Street. Yeah. Um, it's now flawed. that's one that Ted Turner actually colorized, I think, and kind of ruined. Yeah, but I saw the black and white version. And um, 
you know, by the way, really- I like the expensive graphics on the show. Really good. What are you talking Where's, to me? Where is this list? <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, no. I'm sorry. I could have done that. I, you know what? You're right. And I feel bad now. <laughs> want me to get a magic marker and just write you want me to? It I, you know what? I could actually do it if you want to see my list, but it's messed up anyway. No, so okay, I, fine. We don't need it. Yeah, there's know. what's not to like about uh, Natalie Wood. And uh, she's, you know, it, it, that whole movie is almost as perfect as it gets. I believe, I believe. And then the cane at the end. Right, right. Uh, fantastic. Now, it's pretty far down on my list, so we'll see. Because uh, right in front of it is Home Alone. <laughs> First of all, it's great great actors. Joe yeah. Pesci steals the film. He's just amazing. Um, you know, and Macaulay Culkin is actually going to be on another list we're going to do sometime uh, maybe later on, which is uh, Child Stars Who Peaked at 10. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and- but talk about a kid that should have been taken away from social services. Uh you know, the, the, the family just leaves him there. And that's yeah. the whole movie. Twice. There's another one, Home Alone 2, right? They didn't yeah. learn their lessons. You know, it's funny. I, um, John Hurd, who plays the dad in that, I, um, I, uh, my wife's sister dated him a couple times, went out with him a couple times. So he's about 20 years older than him, too. So, it's like, you know, it's interesting. But he said, what a sweetheart of a guy, you know, for uh, why you heard different. Well, I. Yeah, I actually did. But That's I, funny. I don't want well, to maybe he treats women I mean, better than us. I think he had some difficulties in, in a relationship that were pretty well documented. So, oh, <laughs> well, that's, that's your background. But as I long as it that. wasn't related to you, it's good. All right. Okay. Sorry. Christmas let's, story. Before we get a lawsuit, let's move on. Okay. So, Christmas story comes in at number six. Yeah. All although right. that's overrated. Really? Yeah. And they're going to reboot it. Did you hear that? Oh, and, yes. With somebody. Yeah. And Billingsley may actually be the dad now that. Uh, oh, they played the kid. Aaron McGavin. Play. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Um, and that's why they're doing it, because they think it'll have some appeal. But again, that's just. Search. All right. National yeah, that's National- what we need is a movie about a kid with a high powered rifle. <laughs> <laughs> Another one, right? That's a Law and Order episode. It's not a new movie about Christmas. I'm going to get in trouble for telling this joke. Do you remember Emo Phillips joke? Sure. No, I remember Emo. Emo used to do a joke. He goes, I love to go to the park and watch the children jump and scream. They don't know I'm shooting blanks. And, I, and this is from 35 years ago. And I we thought. We shouldn't be laughing, but that's. No, but uh, I mean, you got to understand when he did it, yeah. you know, yeah, that, to show, to, just to show people it's about, you know, when you're talking about gun violence and that sort of thing, you mentioned. And his was, act was all about saying outrageous things. Outrageous and that things, kind of right. sing-songy kind of delivery. Uh, Polar Express comes in at number uh, five. Oh, you lost me there. You don't is, like the Polar Express? That's a mess. I don't like that whole animation, whatever that's called. I forget. It's a special kind of animation. Oh, you know what was great about that, though? The kids had the books, and then they could see the movie. And the book okay. was so big. Yeah, my daughter, we saw that on an IMAX 3D, and she was reaching out for the snow because she wasn't that intelligent at that age. Um, but uh, it, it's uh, 4.0 at U of M now, so it all worked out. But uh she, uh, yeah, kids loved it, but I just found that kind of that animation style of its name it, it escapes me kind of creepy and weird. Hmm, that's weird. It's kind of like the um, uh, the stuff that they did with the um, Tim Burton stuff, right? Kind of almost Tim Burton, a little bit, but not that not the same kind of stop action. It's some other kind of uh, computer generated thing that uh, bugs me. Okay, come number four, Die Hard. It's a Christmas okay. movie. All right, uh, here's well, the argument. Okay, go ahead. Do you think it, I, the reason I say it's a Christmas movie is because the backdrop really get, I mean, you could t- if you did not have that around Christmas, if you had it just around a business office party or whatever, Christmas kind of adds, uh, I think, um, uh, a, a sense to it that of, you know, he, uh, look, gotta- I agree with you. And the soundtrack has like six or seven Christmas songs on it. Uh, and Die Hard 2, fun fact, is also on Christmas Eve. Uh, but the thing is, the diehard argument that the that the people who don't agree with us say is that that could have been a Halloween party. It could have been no. An that's the thing. Anniversary party. Couples for getting back together on Christmas is part yes. of the whole. No, that's right? a hallmark standard. Well, getting right. the family back together. But that really is kind of the last ten seconds and the first twenty seconds of the movie, and the rest of it is an action film. Bruce Willis, by the way, says it's not a Christmas movie when they roasted him, and he says. It's a goddamn Bruce Willis movie, <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny. So Edward Scissor's Hand is a Christmas movie? Is that no? Uh, Bad Santa, I love. Is that yeah. what you just said? Um, to hell with that movie. Polar Express, no. Got a couple of other. Emo Phillips, I don't know what he's trying to say there. 
Um, yeah, anyway. Um, but I think part of this is, you know, when I, when I, so let me finish up my list here. Again, we're talking about study. Is Stop. that possible? Why you gotta be mean, man? Why you gotta be mean? Why you gotta be like that? Um, okay. Um, bu- 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 all right. Wonderful life comes in at number three. Yeah. Although if you take the last 15 minutes off of that, we did a whole piece with Tom Clavin, the, uh, the great author on a show I do called, uh, Air Hamptons with Bridget and Bill on NPR. And he points out all the twisted hunger, depression, everything that, you know, Frank Capra as a filmmaker came from Italy, uh, lived through the depression and made some really dark movies. And until, uh, until the happy ending where an angel gets his wing every time, uh, it's a really, it's really a dark film. film. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, if you think about it, there's a lot of those films that you couldn't make today in the same way you couldn't put all in the family on television right now. No, of course. You know, but the, yeah. And the other thing that's interesting that's been talked about a lot is that film came out in July was a complete uh, box office dud. Uh, it's a wonderful life. And then, you know, this many years later became kind of a classic. Interesting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, my wife, it's my wife's favorite and we watch it every year. And I think part of it, there's a lot of depression around the holidays, right. And people that, you know, have heart that aren't with somebody and stuff like that. And we've, you know, we've gone out of our way to reach out to some of my, but we we always, our house was always the house where everybody would be. We'd have nine kids and I wanted them in our house. I didn't want my son out someplace I didn't know. So our house became that place. And over the years, you know, either parents have died or sometimes parents split. And so Christmas time, when we were, when we were back East, you know, 16 some years ago, but now my kids are men and they're starting their own families and all that other stuff. But I, I do think that, you know, it is it, the thing that really strikes a chord with me with wonderful life is that, you know, that, the holidays and there's something about the winter solstice. So you take religion out for a second because mm-hmm. the winter solstice predated, you know, uh, Christianity and, and all the religions really, you know, just that kind of sense of like, um, you know, after the 21st of December, they start to see the sun again and it, you know, or unless you're Bill McCuddy and the lights go out, there you go. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Somebody, somebody just called me. I think it was ghost of Jimmy Stewart. Okay. Anyway. So yeah, a wonderful life has a special meaning. Um, number two for me is Bill Murray Scrooged. Ah, it's, yeah. It's, it's a great, and you know, Bill Murray in anything is-, is, is They've kind of tried to redo that in a thing called Spirited, which is now on Netflix. Yeah, right. With, uh, with Will Ferrell and uh, Ryan, and Ryan Reynolds. Reynolds, right? And it's it's okay. It's a solid BB plus, but it's nowhere near as cool as Scrooged is. Not mm-hmm. as dark, no Michael O'Donohue, none of the, the cool little asides of, uh, of Scrooge. Okay, Agree so- 100% with you. All right, my number one Christmas film of all time. Do you know which I've left out? Uh, if it's mine, it would be Elf. Oh, El- it's funny you say Elf. I mean, Elf is good. Um, and, and Will okay. Ferrell, it's hilarious. And it's, it's the really- best coffee in the world. No. You know what I look at Elf like? I look at Elf the same way I look at planes, trains, and automobiles. Oh, that's, it's- and that's not that's on your list? Thanksgiving. That's a Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, okay. right. So, but um, my number one is Charlie Brown Christmas. <laughs> Because it's right. I mean, we laugh whenever we get a it Christmas explains tree. a lot about your tree. One year I went out and one year I was in charge of the tree. It's never happened since. And I came home with like a four foot tree. And I said, we're going to have a Charlie Brown. And they all looked at me like, what is wrong with you, man? But I do know that all of I mean, I, my whole family as adults, we can still sit down and watch watch it. And your heart, it just takes you back. There's something about that. You are the orphaned house. And I'm, I'm sure the I'm sure the spiked eggnog was the other thing that made you. You don't like the Charlie popular. Brown Christmas? Oh, no, I do. I be, And I believe in having everybody over that can possibly come by. No. Uh, it's also the time of year when, as a critic, I get sent everything under the sun, uh, yeah. in, including this from Amazon, which was an advent calendar with, instead of one crappy gift, 30 crappy little gifts. Um, <laughs> this, anything to get our vote. You know, uh, back when we were in D.C. and I was doing nights at WMAL and they would people would send me books, the publishers, and I, I would keep them. And I and for my, my wife and one day just came in and took them all out and were gone, sent them to Goodwill. And, you know, but we do. I mean, that's so that's the kind of swag you get goofy stuff. I, I get intellectual stuff. My green that. my green room joke at Fox News was always when they would sign it to me, I would say, will you make that to successful eBay bidder? <laughs> <laughs> all right, Mr. McCutty. So, um. We'll talk to you again. I like doing this. I like doing these lists with you. I want to do, I do want to do one on the, 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 the worst childhood actor 
Uh, I mean, like, for example, like if you look at uh, Macaulay Culkin as somebody that never came out, never escaped that role. Um, I would say Drew Barrymore didn't really escape it either, even though she did movies later on. Um, no, she was a little more successful. And by the way, Kiri Culkin, some of the other Culkin met family members have done uh, great stuff. really good work. Really Rory good Culkin. Work. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah, all right, let's do them. Uh, we've got, it's almost the end of the year, so we should do the best and worst in, in the next couple of weeks. I look forward to it. Let's do it. Um, let's do it a week from today. What do you say? That'd be tremendous. All right, Mr. McCuddy. Find him. Bill McCuddy. He didn't put his first name up there because he's he's a guy's guy. McCuddy. Hey, McCuddy. I just wanted to see how this would go before I commit. No, I, was like, I tell your story all the time, too, by the way. It's a, it's, no, serious. Your, your story in show business is, is kind of right out of uh, – uh, it's a wonderful life without the, the suicide part. All right. yes. Get out of here. Thank you, Mr. McCuddy. Thanks, buddy. That's it, buddy. You can see him on uh, NPR and again, goldderby.com. Um, all right. So this is this next story is one that should just freak you out. Uh, and and I and I, it, it does me. But for a reason, I think that is, um, well, it's something that I've been thinking about a long time. I talked about this a little bit yesterday. We we're supposed to have David on yesterday and we got to screw up. But uh, I, I remember after 9-11 hearing all the things that, that could be affected, you know, uh, everything from our water supply to our infrastructure. Um, uh, filmmaker David uh, Tice, excuse me, is going to be with us in a second. And he, I'm going to read a little bit of what he's written here before I, I show you a teaser. Americans are so focused on whether Republicans or Democrats are in power. We've lost sight of how we could be all out of power, regardless of our politics. And there is the, the truth behind that is. Well, it, I'll be honest with you, it's really frightening. Watch this. There's a weird calmness about this hearing. This is not calm. The Russians are already in the grid. This is not a threat. This is happening. We are under attack. We are in a very dangerous place. I just think this has to be an emergency, an urgent situation. John Wellinghoff was chairman of FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Wellinghoff commissioned a study to see if a physical attack on critical transformers could trigger cascading blackouts. It was actually a very shocking result to us that there's very few number of substations you need to take out uh, in the entire United States to knock out the entire grid. Knock out the entire grid? That's correct. How many would it take to knock out putting the entire country in a blackout? Less than 20. <laughs> That's pretty frightening. Uh, joining us right now is the uh, the filmmaker behind this uh, this well this I can't think of a better word than frightening uh, David Tice. David, hi, how are you, my friend? I'm great, thanks. Can I move this around get better lighting? Yeah, that looks good. I know it's hard to tell in the in the previously um, slightly ironic, and that you're such a great filmmaker, and that we're having <laughs> a hard time with this. Hey, um, let me just jump right in here and say that this is not new. We've been talking about this for a while. Um, what made you uh, make this film right now and, and try to get this message out to Americans? Well, I've been working on this for about three years. So kind of fortuitous timing with the recent events in North Carolina, uh, right. Oregon, Washington. Let me but tell everybody, by the way, uh, essentially what they're, they thought it was uh, two couple goobers knocked down a fence, shot shotguns at a power station and knocked power out from anywhere from 50 to 75,000 people in about, about an hour east of um, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, this was obviously not an orchestrated terrorist attack, but what would that look like, David? So we cover in the film in 2013, there was a serious orchestrated terrorist attack on uh, the, the Metcalf substation right outside Silicon Valley and where they utilize AK-47s, they essentially took out surveillance cameras, et cetera. And it didn't cause a huge outage because power was diverted, you know, uh, thankfully. But this is a threat. And that threat was covered by 60 Minutes back in February earlier this year. And it was rerun again in August. Um, in the movie, the... I forget the name of the person that said this, said that 20 substations is, is what it would essentially take to knock the power out. That sounds like a small number, but that would be a pretty uh, Herculean task, right? To knock out 20 substations or would it? Well, a bunch of yahoos aren't going to do it. That's not what we're concerned about. We're concerned right. about nation states 
And we talk in the film about North Korea, Iran, Russia, and China. And one of those bad actors could choose to bring us down and frankly, bring it down our critical civilian infrastructure is a part of their playbook. We've heard that from defectors where we've been able to get information that's been provided by defectors that this, this is a game plan. I mean, I, I know that we've all heard about the EMP, the neutron bomb, the, the electromagnetic pulse. Uh, the, the EMP would actually, it would fry um, all the transistors and, you know, we, we would have lose power and everything from, you know, our, our homes to our cars. Uh, but that's not what you're talking about more. You're talking about actually attacking these individual substations. How would terrorists do that? Okay. So let me clarify in our film, we talk about four major threats, okay. the physical attack that we're yeah. talking about today, which was Metcalf. Then we are still very concerned about electromagnetic pulse or EMP and then a cyber attack that Ted Koppel did a major book about in 2015, 2016, where and, and what Senator Angus King was talking about, where our adversaries are in the grid and potentially could knock it out based on malware. And then the fourth is a geomagnetic disturbance. So and it's very possible that a, an adversary could combine some of those threats. But a physical attack, if, uh, and in fact, John Wellinghoff, who you just saw in the earlier clip, he used to be the chairman of FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And he found that if you picked out nine critical nodes where they have these super, you know, high intensity transformers, as few as nine could potentially take out the grid coast to coast. Mm. Or, you know, it's interesting. The The thing that worries me the most is the cyber because malware can can hide in a system. You know, um, there's the Internet and then but the Pentagon employs a thing called the zipper net, which, in other words, there's no nobody can get in from the outside. You know, however, as we as we saw with Chelsea Manning, you could take, you know, a thumb drive and then leave with that. So there are there were other ways to get that. And I, hopefully they've tightened that up. But the obviously, when people have access to a system. Uh, that means that they also have access to disrupting that system. And, and so there, there are those instances. And I, and I wonder, what was your take? Should the, say the power in maybe 75% of America's cities was taken out for two or three days, how catastrophic would that be? Well, two or three days, uh, even after 12 hours, if it's the whole country, the the bad guys are going to come out. The thugs are going to come out and they're going to be breaking into stores, et cetera. And there's going to be people that are going to be hungry after two days and worried about their kids. But what I'm the most worried about is when we're talking about three months, nine months, a year and a half. And if that's nationwide, then suddenly South Carolina can't rush to bring food to North Carolina. Right. If you're talking about coast to coast and you're talking about nine months, then it truly becomes almost zombie apocalypse. And, and people are killing their neighbors in order to get food and water to, to feed their kids. And, and therefore, all bets are off. And that's what we're worried about. And this threat can be protected against, so we can have a happy ending here if we just do the right thing, if we as citizens stand up, tell our legislators, regulators, board of directors, the utilities, we're not gonna stand for this vulnerability. David, uh, the title of the film and where people can find it. So it's Grid Down, Power Up. We have a substantive website at griddownpowerup.com. We're also available on the App Store. You, you can download that and actually write letters to your congressmen, state legislators, board of directors of utilities. The film is not out yet because we're holding off to build a crescendo for a uh, massive release in mid-January. You can but there's a, there's a great minute eight trailer. minute version on YouTube that I saw so people can get an idea, you know. Yes, we, we have a very uh, fulfilling eight minute uh, highlights reel that will really give you a feel for it. And yeah, so just go to YouTube, that. grid down, put grid down and it'll show up. I just did it. So it shows right up and they can see it. David, thank you. Um, I'd like to talk to you again. This is obviously uh, 
one of those scenarios we hope never happens, but we have to address it because it's we're quite vulnerable in these areas, as, as evidenced in North Carolina. Be well, my friend. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. We look forward to being back. See you, buddy. Again, uh, David Tice, who directed this movie, uh, Grid Down, Power Up. Um, scary stuff. Speaking of scary stuff, here she is right now. Uh, that would be Nikki Maduro and Mark Thompson. Yeah, um, thank you. Hi. Boy, so we had an interesting show today. Um, you know, one of the things I want to tell you guys is that, and this drives me nuts when I when it, people talk about uh, the uh, Brittany Griner thing, and they said, you know, uh, Marsha Blackburn, the senator from Tennessee, came out and said, we left another American behind. And I said, you know, shut your hillbilly pig hole. You, you know, be responsible. Because, first of all, um, we don't know what the deal looked like. Uh, second of all, this guy is not uh, uh, John Ryan. From, Whalen, uh, yeah, Whalen. Uh, not, yeah. Yeah. He, he was kicked out of the Marines for uh, writing bad checks and stealing Social Security numbers. So this yeah. is, you know, this is, again, I don't want anybody, any American that shouldn't exactly. be in a Russian Dang. prison, you know. Well, what a surprise it's been taken by, uh, you know, one party or members of a party and politicized. And, you know, they're they're essentially trading on it politically. Well, like, how could you leave one behind? It's, you know. You don't leave any gotten, American behind. How about that? Rick Wilson, Rick Wilson said, geez, could it be? That she's black and gay? No, no way. That no, that's be definitely, it. I mean, that definitely didn't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then uh, that whole patriotism test where and she doesn't stand for the anthem or whatever. Who what, cares? That's American. The she doesn't know the, the words for the anthem, whatever. I, this whole litmus test for patriotism in this country is insanity. And that's just another thing that's just, you know, they wrap themselves in the flag. It's I just, would love it's to hear despicable. Mitch McConnell try to sing the national anthem. I'd pay money to oh, see please. that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, Chip, I watched your show. You had David K. Johnson. You're, you got a great show, Chip, and c congratulations. Yeah. Uh, so my show's not as great, okay? So screw <laughs> you. All right, I've got Friday Fabulous Florida today. We're going to talk about the Pentagon budget. Did you did you mention that, Chip? I don't think so. It, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's blown out. I'm just a little competitive, okay? That's all. And what I'm saying is this Pentagon budget is out of control. This unaudited Pentagon budget is absolutely obscene. Uh, we'll touch on it. We'll also touch on the, the moving of cinema to, the, to an independent status. Uh, two political uh, minds that are terrific. Again, Michael Shore and Jim Avila, former senior correspondent for ABC. It's Friday Fabulous Florida. As I was saying, we also do movie reviews on Friday. Chip, I'm speaking quickly because, unfortunately, i got to start my show. It's right, called best, the Mark Thompson Show. Best Christmas of all time. We did that. Best What is it? Best Christmas movie of all time. Oh, uh, I just watched Bad Santa, which is really good. Yeah, I might go Bad Santa also. It's yeah. pretty strong. You know Billy yeah. Bob Thornton. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's it's little... pretty funny, man. It really is. I love the one where in um, in Trading Places, where uh, Dan Aykroyd is dressed up as Santa and he's drunk and he's eating the food with <laughs> beers and beer oh and yeah, beer that's a good one. <laughs> Fall from grace. Fall from What grace. was your favorite though, Chip? What's your favorite Christmas oh, oh, movie? Charlie not Brown. Christmas. It's, it's just Charlie it, it Brown. Yeah, that's true. When I was a little kid, I just love it. Oh, oh yeah. what? Yeah, <laughs> die hard. Christmas, little die sappy. Hard Christmas movie. Little sappy. Yes, all right, that's is. good. Yes, yeah, yeah, all right, all right. Love you guys. All right, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. That's Mark Thompson. Um. Yeah, so yeah, it is. It's to me, it's that last guest. I uh, that film is. Nice, just, yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the idea that our um, there is already malware run by bad actors in our power grid, and they could shut it down. And it doesn't surprise you know, me at all. But it's frightening. It's absolutely frightening. I would still do the show every day, even without power. I would just sit here, <laughs> just sit there in the dark by yourself, here and talking yeah. to this, even if it doesn't work. You know, <laughs> just put a little put a little face on there. It's like you're talking to somebody. Uh, how did you, little girl? She's doing actually really well. Um, uh, thank you for asking uh, for people that don't know. She has Crohn's, but she started her infusions and it's literally making a difference that she I can is see. A, she is a, she's yeah. adorable now. I can only imagine when she's 17 years old. <laughs> oh, Lord. Her life. Yeah. What do you got going on here, kiddo? <laughs> We're going to start off. Uh, in By the, the way, uh, Nikki Maduro's show starts at 12. Mark starts yeah. right now. Right now, um, yes, in about one minute. Time. So I'm going to be actually talking to someone that writes for reason.com about this Virginia mother who has been told by CPS, your children can never play outside by themselves. And it's this whole debate of, oh my God, is that that old kids? story that's been going on forever? That same well, family? I don't know if it's the same family. They've been, in, they've had run-ins with CPS before, but it is this idea of- Well, they let their kid walk home from school once and somebody- No, called different family. Oh, different, different family. family. Okay. It's a yeah. different family, but it's still under the umbrella of this free range- parenting and is it really free range for your kid to be playing in the front yard by themselves so we'll talk with one of the reporters that covered it 
about the family. She interviewed the family out in Virginia. So we'll talk on that. It's Friday. We're going to talk movies. So we just have a bunch of stuff coming up on this Friday. Right, oh, right. and I'm also going to try my very first, you'll be happy, my very first impossible chicken. So we have a Friday food segment. So I'm going to try that. I've never I have eaten no it idea what that means. It's like not real chicken. It's the fake stuff, you know, so I can oh, get myself oh, off oh, meat. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Really, yeah, you know that. I know. I know. So I'm, you should be proud of me. I'm doing this for you. The carnivore <laughs> is eating fake meat. So we'll see how okay. that goes. <laughs> All right. I'll be watching, my All friend. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Show. Coming right up. All right. Um, something I want, to, I want you to take with you uh, uh, before we go over the weekend, when you have these conversations with people, as I mentioned before, that want to talk about um, – about, uh, you know, leaving a Marine behind. Well, today's news is bittersweet for the family of American Paul Whelan. Whelan, a former Marine and corporate security executive, remains in a Russian prison. He was arrested. I just want everybody to understand that th these swaps work not on our end, but on their end. It's not like they don't come to us and say, so who do you want out? They cut the deal, you know, and has the United States become weaker by giving, uh, uh, doing the trade. Well, the, the bottom line is, is that we're learning more and more about what Putin's world is like and fewer and fewer Americans are gonna go there. I mean, this is bad in every possible way for them. Uh, did we want Whalen out? Yeah. Um, is, is he the model Marine that everybody points to like Marsha Blackburn and others that say we left another American behind or they wanna talk about Americans in Afghanistan? Um, you know, uh, this is this is a talking point that you, you should really be prepared for. So when your right wing friends come up and talking about this, say, do you know, actually know who this guy is? Well, now, you know. All right. So anyway. All right. So that's it. On Monday, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the, the crypto crash. And does anybody out there actually have cryptocurrency and, and how bad did you get burned and what the hell is it all about? And it's really interesting, among other things. Obviously, whatever happens over the weekend, we'll get to that as well. Um, thank you for being here. And remember, please subscribe to this channel. It's real simple. And, uh, and again, if you ever have tax issues, my good friend Steve Moskowitz of MoskowitzLLP.com, top tax attorneys. They sponsor the show and they are good people. And I've been to them many times and send many of my friends there who had tax problems. And then they didn't have tax problems. That's the kind of people they are. Again, Moss with LLP.com, triple eight tax deal. I'm Chip Franklin. You can follow me and see more of these shows by going to whatthefranklin.com or put my name into YouTube. Till then, you guys have a great weekend. Thanks. I can handle things. I'm a spy. We shall overcome. Yes, we can. Person, woman, man, camera, TV. What the fuck is wrong with you? We'll